You know what time it is. It's time for the breakdown. Well, welcome back to Kingdom Life Community, where we have the opportunity to walk through these incredible life-changing series week by week. We're in the middle of one right now entitled Discipleship 101, and thankfully we are in uh, season one. We found out uh, we're in season one. I can't wait uh, for season two. This week will be coming up, I believe, on the finale, uh, but from last week's message, we're going to give you a breakdown. Uh, we are in part nine of Discipleship 101. Uh, it was titled Discipleship, It's Just Not All That. Now, the anchor scripture for this Pastor Thompson gave uh, was from Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. <laughs> in the New King James Version, uh, it reads, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, By the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. He emphasized in this that it was our reasonable service. So hold on to that because we'll need it later in the message. From there, he shared with us that perspective is powerful. How we see a thing affects what we think about it and ultimately how we respond to it. Some have a faulty view of the very natural process that we call discipleship. In fact, many are making it too big a deal. And he reminded us, it's just not all that. From here, he broke down Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 2, uh, into manifesting it. And he shared the process where we combine the Holy Spirit and Word of God. And he shared the process starts with your spirit, where salvation occurs, leading to your soul, where transformation occurs, going forward to the body, where sanctification occurs, and ending in my world for demonstration. He broke this down further, and he shared that it's really interesting that in this process that the Lord does all these things. The Lord saves, the Lord transforms, the Lord sanctifies, and ultimately the Lord demonstrates. And so just as salvation is not something we choose nor something we cause to take place, it is the Lord's doing and happens to us. So our growth in Christ is the work of the Holy Spirit in a yielded vessel of faith. Our job is not to change. Our job is to surrender. And just as Jay restated, Pastor, he shared that perspective is powerful. So from there, he gave us a way to get a proper perspective. He shared four ways not to view discipleship and one healthy view of God's plan to grow us. So he shared that it's not all that. One, Don't view it as an unusual experience, remembering that it is the normal life cycle of a Christ carrier. Two, don't view it as a special commitment made only by the zealous and extreme. Three, don't view it as something you must accomplish. And four, don't view it as optional or an elective part of an overall Christian experience. Then he gave us the healthy perspective. Discipleship should be viewed as what naturally and virtually effortlessly happens to those who have been authentically invaded by Christ and have yielded to his lordship and leadership in their lives. From there, he said it's interesting to note that the word discipleship is never mentioned in the Bible. It is modeled but never stated as a thing to do. Yeshua's disciples never took a class on it. And today, we are so disconnected from the flow of what God is doing that we must take a class and teach people how to do it. Pastor Thompson then shared with us that we need to keep keeping it simple. Uh, He shared to us what happened to the disciples is, in fact, as simple as one, two, and three. And breaking it down, he shared these three stages began with the time that they spent with Yeshua and walked with him. 
The second phase was when they were invaded and overwhelmed by his spirit on the day of Pentecost. And then lastly, when they cultivated their spiritual relationship with the Father, established through the Son, being led and empowered by the Spirit, and God used them. He emphasized here that this breakdown in point one uh, was actually the New Testament books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They were invaded and overwhelmed in Acts. And then from Romans to Revelation was this cultivation and continuation of the process. He then mirrored it, and he said, what happens to us should also be as simple as one, two, and three. Now, he did share here that it's not always going to be in the same order, remembering that the disciples were actually here and were able to walk through their spiritual experience with Christ. They actually were friends with them. <laughs> they hung out with Christ. And since Christ, his body has moved on, we'll have a different experience. So he started us off uh, sharing that we should be invaded and overwhelmed by his spirit on our personal day of Pentecost. He reminded us that it's not a set day uh, like it was in the Old Testament when that day occurred and it passed. Instead, we would have our own spiritual birthday, if you will, when the Spirit has moved in to us and we have had union uh, with His Spirit. Following this is when we would spend time with Yeshua and walk with Him. And then lastly, we would continue to cultivate our spiritual relationship with the Father, established through the Son, being led and empowered by the Spirit, and God ultimately using us. He then shared that today, many of us make so much of growing to become a disciple of Christ that it requires massive energy and effort on our part. And it's just not all that. It's simple. So simple, we might just throw it on a t-shirt here. Uh, but it said, be it, live it, show it, share it. He reminded us, that's it. All there is to it is this cyclical relationship. Be it, live it, show it, share it. He mirrored this to the LGBTQ uh, plus community uh, where, you know, someone might say, you know, in the first stage uh, that they are gay, that they are, uh, you know, in this, you know, initial state of seeing or, or believing, uh, rather, where they are. Then they move forward where they live uh, in that stage. They live as uh, someone who is gay, okay? And they're moving forward. They said, all right, now you've got a, a, a boyfriend. You've got, uh, you know, someone who you've connected with in that way. And you move from there, and you live as an openly gay person. Instead of being closeted, instead of hiding your identity, you move into that phase. And then finally, you move to a place where you are open, you are sharing it, you are prepared to explain your lifestyle. Someone asks you about it, you're able to say, this is the reason, this is how I'm living. Pastor Thompson immediately told us, hey, church community, where are we? Where do we wake up from here? Are we ready to come out? To the point where we are Christ carriers, we can be it. We can then live it as a Christ-caring disciple. We can share it. We can show it. I am open about my Christ-caring disciple lifestyle, and then I can share it, where I am prepared to explain to others about my Christian life, my community, my, my family, my everyone who I'm connected with. Am I able to do that? Continuing on with the theme of keeping it simple, Pastor gave us this statement. He said that God has called us to just one thing, rest. It's just that simple. From there, he took us into Matthew 11, chapters 28 to 30, where he emphasized and highlighted some parts of, this, of these scriptures. And he said that if you were just to read the parts that were highlighted, it would be so impactful and powerful. It says, come to me, I will give you rest, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. From there, Pastor took us into kind of a mini Bible study in Hebrews chapter 3 and 4, which in summation, he shared that God's invitation has not changed. Receive Yeshua and enter his rest. It's not all that. It's just that simple. 
It is as natural and should be as seamless and automatic as growing from an infant to a full-grown adult. It just happens. The life of a yielded and surrendered disciple is the life of rest God has promised. When we resist him, however, we fail to enter in and consequently live a dismal, uncomfortable, peaceless life of the in-between, lukewarm living. This is not plan A living. He then showed us a way to live through the seven R's, the natural process of of entering into God's promised rest. And we're going to pull them up here uh, and go through all seven, walking through them one by one. The very first one is to receive Christ, to accept him in. The second is to repent from living without him. That's when you were living out perhaps in the the world, as we call it, uh, living to your carnal ways. Then you respond to the leading of the Lord. You I hear you, God. I'm going to do something about it. And you request to be filled with his spirit. Upon being filled with his spirit, we begin that process of, of mind renewal. You're renewing your mind on the world. It's going to change everything inside of you. And you remember who you really are. And ultimately, then, we get to rejoice in the Lord always. Now, wait. This isn't going to be up there. This was a bonus one that he gave us. He told us after this, we can relax. That's your bonus R. You can relax. Find rest in the Lord. Relax. Matter of fact, let's talk about living in God's rest. Rest is releasing every stress and trusting God. So the bonus eighth R, again, is to relax and allow God to have his way. He's much better at being God than you are. So in closing, he reshared that perspective is powerful. How we see a thing affects what we think about it and how we respond to it. Just think of anything in your life that you interact with and the perspective that you have towards it could be completely different based off of how you see it. Some have a faulty view of the very natural process we call discipleship. Many are making it too big a deal. It's just not all that. So pastor closed with a question. If growing in Christ and living as a disciple is so natural, why are so few living the kingdom life? The answer, we've been duped. Having been taught by religion to understand Christianity incorrectly and corrupting the truth that makes us free. He closed with a prayer. Lord, thank you for the life-giving truth of your word. Thank you for opening our eyes to your plan to give us rest. Reach us, save us, fill us, lead us, and use us for your glory. Then, when we have lived our earthly lives of rest, take us home into your eternal rest. We are so excited to be coming to the close of just the first season of Discipleship 101. This has been a really impactful series uh, on my life personally. Uh, This was, uh, I mean, tears were flowing in the studio last week as we were just thinking, you know, how many people around us know? How many of us, uh, you know, are are living, you know, out in the open for Christ? Um, Pastor Thompson last week uh, shared that example. You know, you, you turn on Netflix and Uh, You can't go, you know, but five minutes or a few episodes into something uh, and you see, you know, representation of uh, different cultures or values or ideas and and ask that question of why don't we have that as Christ caring disciples? So this was a challenge uh, to submit, to yield to the Lord and to continue to live as a Christ caring disciple. We're so excited once again to hear about what Pastor Thompson has to say this week. Can't wait to hear from him next. We'll turn it over to him now. I, I want to thank John and Toya for the breakdown uh, this morning and for bringing us uh, up to date with regard to what we have shared in this message. And I certainly hope that you have been blessed by the first nine installments of this series. Join me, if you would, now in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. And I'm going to read for you from the New King James Version, Yeshua Modified. The scripture reads, And Yeshua came and spoke to them, saying, 
All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. I welcome you to Discipleship 101, Part 10. And as we get our footing for today's message, I would ask you to join me in 1 John chapter 4, verse 17. It's a short verse, and it simply states, Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in this world. Our subject for this morning, as we consider Discipleship 101 Part 10, is we cannot help it. We cannot help it. I received a text message from someone recently, and they were uh, encouraging me to continue walking with the Lord. And they said, basically, that uh, whenever they see me, they see Christ. That I am uh, modeling Christ and reflecting his image in my life to the degree that when they encounter me, when they experience me, when they engage me, they see Christ. And I wrote them back and I said, Praise God. And I said, just before that, I said, I can't help it. And that's the truth. I have been possessed by the Spirit of God. I have been apprehended by him so that even when I have tried, and I have tried, even when I have tried to subdue the presence of God in my life, I have been unsuccessful. I can't help it. I've been apprehended by him. And, you know, there's a song we used to talk about how uh, I went to the church one night and something got a hold of me and, and talked about how I was changed. I've been changed. Christ has gotten hold of me, and it has changed so much about who I am that I'm at the point now where I can't help it. Even if I were try, if I if I were to try to go back and be uh, the the John I used to be, I would just be doing a bad imitation. People would know, seeing me, that I was not authentically there. I they I'd give myself away on the street. They would know that there was something about me. That was not right because I've gotten to the point where I can't help it. And that's what I want to say with regard to discipleship. As we close out this season, the truth is we can't help it. Christ has taken hold of us. and He's going to have his way. We really can't help it. Go with me back into 1 John chapter 4. I want to take a look at that verse again. There's something profound there that it says at the end of the verse. He, John writes, as he is, so are we in this world. As he is, so are we in this world. He says, love is perfected among us, and we're going to be bold in the day of judgment. Why? Because as he is, so are we in this world. I'm just like him in this world. And so there's something that happens to me when he comes and puts his spirit on the inside of me. He begins to conform me to his image so that as he is, so am I in this world. Religion is always trying to put a separation between the believer and Christ. Religious people are comfortable saying 
I am a believer. They are comfortable saying, I'm a Christ follower. Because both those realities are um, extensions of my own volition. I choose to believe. I choose to follow. It puts me subconsciously, without even being aware, as soon as you say, I'm a Christ follower, I'm a Christ believer, it puts you in the driver's seat. It puts you in the place of control, and it subjugates him to your will. I have chosen to follow him, which means whenever I decide I'm going to stop following, I'm no longer a follower. But I am not just a, follow, a follower, nor am I just a believer. I am a Christ carrier. I have been invaded by the Spirit of Christ. I am a Christ carrier. Christ lives within me. And I am a Christ carrier. I, it's, it's not just that I'm a Christ follower. And religion is okay with you following. But when you start talking about Christ carrying, I'm almost finished with my master's program. I'm almost done with it. I'm in the last uh, 11 weeks of the program. And I have yet, in all of the courses, I can't even tell you how many hours of courses I have taken. It's a long program. And in all of the courses that I have taken, I have yet to hear anyone describe Christians as Christ carriers. I have not heard it. I have heard Christ followers in most of the papers that I write. I've put Christ follower because Christ carrier, it just doesn't, you don't mean that. It gets marked up. You don't mean that you mean Christ follower, for Christ follower. Because we're okay with that. Because it, it, it puts that veil back up. And it separates us from him. It's okay if we worship him. But we, it, it's blasphem, blasphemous for us to talk about being like him. I'm nothing like him. He's God and Christ. And I'm just little old me. I'm a peon. I'm this. And as long as we believe that, Satan has victory without lifting a finger. We don't have to stop what he's doing because we are doing it to ourselves. We are undoing the finished work of Christ upon the cross, which was to eradicate the separation between man and God. The veil was ripped from the top to bottom to signify that there's no more separation. And if there's no more separation, then as he is in this world, so are we. And I want to give you seven truths. I want to help you. I want you to understand that we cannot help this. And I want to give you seven biblical truths that shape our reality without our input. Seven biblical truths that shape our reality without our input. We don't have to buy into these things. They just happen. We cannot help it. I hope you're ready. I want to walk this, through this with you. Number one, we cannot help it. We need to know he started this, therefore he will finish it. He started this, this thing he started with us. We only get to say yes to him one time. He invited us to receive him. We said yes, we will receive him. He started it, and now he will finish it. Hebrews 12, 1 through 2 says this, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Yeshua, the author and finisher of our faith. He is the author. He is the initiator. He started it. And he says, I finish it. It's not you. It's not your faith.
that finishes it. It's not about your taking hold of me. It's about the fact that I have taken hold of you. It's not about your commitment to me. It's about my commitment to you. It's not about your faith in me. It's about my faith in you. God so loved the world because of his faith. He had faith for our salvation when we were lost and on our way to hell. He says he's the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And from the throne, he calls back and says, I started it, and I will finish it. It's just not about me. I can't help it. Number two, we can't help it because in the end, we will be in our finished state. I don't care what you look like now. I need you to know that when you leave here, you will be in your finished state. Hey, listen, right where you are, come on and have a praise break with me. Just right there, say, thank you, Lord, because some of us are so undone. We're wondering whether or not we're going to be finished when we come out. I'm telling you, in the end, before you leave here, we will be in our finished state. Philippians 1, 3 through 6 says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you always in every prayer of mine, making request for you all with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it. Somebody say, he's going to finish me. He will complete it until the day of Yeshua Christ. Before you come up out of here, you will be in your finished state. Number three, some of us think we've, we've dropped it. We've, we've blown it. We've done so much that he's tired of us. Listen, he never loses nor lets go of anyone. We can't help it. Got nothing to do with you. He never loses nor lets go of anyone. John chapter 10, verses 25 through 30. Yeshua answered them, I told you, and you do not believe me. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me, but you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. As I said to you, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, for they and they follow me. Stop right there before we go on, and I just want to underscore that some of us are trying to get people to believe who cannot believe because they are not his sheep. And because they're not his sheep, listen now, they are hearing your voice outside their head but they're not hearing his voice inside their head. They're hearing your voice going through their outer ear, but they're not hearing his voice resonating in their inner ear. They're, 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 you're trying to convince them through logic what can only be received by faith. And he says, you saw what I did and still don't believe because you're not my sheep. So the first question we have to ask is whether or not he's on the inside. Is anybody home? Is the shepherd here? Because his sheep hear his voice. He knows them, and they follow. And when you're trying to talk to somebody, and they're having trouble getting it, they're having trouble receiving it, they're resisting. But I just think, but it just seemed like, but it just, you have to stop and ask yourself whether or not they are his sheep. That's a bonus. It wasn't even on the schedule. Number 20, verse 28, and I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. The sheep have eternal life and they shall never perish. Listen, Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, 
and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. You're not coming out of his hand. You're not coming out of my hand. I never lose nor let go of anyone. Listen, we can't help it. What can't we help? We can't help the fact that the seed of God's word never fails. Once the seed of God's word starts to work in my life, I can't help but be changed. James chapter 1 verse 21 says, Therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. On the cross, Christ saved your spirit, but now that you receive Christ, the word of God will save your soul and bring your soul into freedom and wholeness and alignment with what has already happened in your spirit. Mark chapter 4, verse 20, he talks about the parable of the sower and the seed and the ground. And he says, and these are the ones sown on good ground. Where the word is sown on good ground, those who hear the word accept it and bear fruit, some 30-fold, some 60, and some 100. Listen, you can't unhear what you've heard. You can't unsee what you've seen. You can't help it. If you're sitting under the word of God, you are going to be transformed. Isaiah 55, verses 10 and 11. For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth and make it bring forth and bud that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. What? It shall not return to me void. It shall not come back empty, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. The seed of God's word never fails. We can't help it. Number five, we have been programmed to become like him. You don't even have to try to do it. It's in your programming. When the Christ seed goes to work in your life, goes to work in your life, the programming kicks in and transformation starts to unfold. Listen, Luke chapter 6, verse 40. A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone who is perfectly trained will be like his teacher. If you are a disciple, it's part of the programming that you be perfectly trained and become like the teacher. The standard is not you following him. The standard is as he is, so are we in this world. Church, we cannot help it. Number six, once infected by Christ, there is no hiding it. Once infected by Christ, there is no hiding it. I want to use for this an illustration of a man who was not even yet infected by Christ and still couldn't hide it. Simon Peter, Matthew chapter 26, verse 73 through 75, and you know if he couldn't hide it, we're done. He, just, he spent time with him on earth and couldn't hide it. Look at verse 73. And a little later, those who stood by came up and said to Peter, surely you are also one of them. Look, for your speech betrays you. Something about what he was saying, how he was saying it, gave away the fact that he had been with the Lord. Then now he gets mad. He began to curse and swear, saying, I do not know the man. Immediately a rooster crowed, as had been prophesied, and Peter remembered the word of Yeshua, who had said to him, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So he went out and wept bitterly. And I underline that because some of us, we go out from church weeping bitterly. We go out from an encounter with his word weeping bitterly because what we really want 
is to be able to turn this thing off and on. We really want to be able to live it on our terms, and we don't want to be found out, and we are weeping bitterly because despite our best effort to act like we used to act, and to go, some of y'all have gone back to try to do things you used to do, and that shoe doesn't fit anymore. You're trying to squeeze in that little shoe you found in the closet from elementary school when you were in the fourth grade. You're talking about these used to be my favorite shoes. You're about to bust out the side of them because you that shoe doesn't fit anymore. The world doesn't fit anymore. Some of your friends don't fit anymore. Some of your family doesn't fit anymore. Some of that way that you talk doesn't fit anymore. And you go out and weep bitterly. But you might as well embrace it. We cannot help it. Once infected by Christ, there's no hiding it. And number seven, we cannot help it. We started this. He started this. He will finish it. In the end, we will be in our finished state. He never loses nor lets go of anyone. The seed of God's word never fails. We have been programmed to become like him. Once infected by Christ, there's no hiding it. And the light we carry cannot be hidden. Matthew chapter 5 Verses 14 through 16, Yeshua speaking to his disciples says, you are the light of the world. He says, a city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. The city represents lights, you know, where you have industry, where you have building, where you have commerce, where you have people packed in together. And so it's not like lights across a field. There's a house here and a mile away. There's another house and two or three miles away. That's different in the country. But in the city, it's one house on top of another house and the businesses are there and the market is there and the street is there and it's all lit up. And a city on a hill with that kind of light cannot be hidden. He didn't say you ought not hide it. He's saying you cannot hide it. We cannot help it. He said, nor do they take a light and uh, light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Everywhere you go, you're given away. Everywhere you go. If you are a Christ carrier, everywhere you go, people can see something different about you. So he said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. In other words, stop fighting it. It's going to shine anyway. You don't have to let, it, let your light so shine. doesn't mean you've got to give it permission to light. He already told you a city that's set on a hill can't be hidden. He's saying, why don't you come into agreement with your light and stop weeping bitterly so that people can just see your good works and give God the glory he is due. Talking about that light, go with me to John chapter 1. Let's look at that light. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. In the beginning, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He, the Word, was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, the Word. And without Him, the Word, nothing was made that was made. In Him, the Word was life. And the life was the light of men. The word of God, Christ, is the light of men, the life of men. And the light, he shines in darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Best translation, was not able to overtake it. Why? Because we can't help it. If we carry the light, it cannot be hidden. Here they all are for you. Want to take a look at them? Seven things, seven realities, seven truths that shape our reality without our input. Now, you remember we talked last week and the week before that, Romans 12. I'm going to go back into Romans 12, 1 and 2 now because this ought to make more sense. When he's talking about living a life for him, living 
as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, and not being conformed to this world, and proving, therefore, what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I told you that the way that we manifest, Romans 12, 1 and 2, is that the Holy Spirit comes in plus the Word of God and takes us through a process of manifestation. And I showed it to you graphically, where your spirit is changed through salvation, your soul is changed, we call it transformation, your body is commandeered, we call it sanctification, and then he impacts the world through demonstration. And I told you that all of that is the Lord's doing. The Lord saves us, the Lord transforms us, the Lord sanctifies us, the Lord demonstrates his grace and purpose and allows his light to shine in our lives. We looked at Psalm 118, and I pointed out, as I share with you again, this is all the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Here's the truth and perhaps the takeaway of today's message. We were taught a lie by this world. We learned that everything was a matter of our doing, our choosing. And if we didn't want something, all we had to do was say no. The truth is, once we receive him, we cannot help becoming like him. 1 John chapter 4 told us, as he is, so are we in this world. It is the will of God that you and I be transformed and changed into the likeness of Christ. So I say this. Let me give you this bit of advice. We might as well stop fighting it and just be it, live it, show it, and share it. That's it. Once we embrace this reality, walking with the Lord is going to be much easier and much more enjoyable for us. Some, fighting it, are missing out. Say this with me. Be it, live it, show it, share it. That's it. Be it, live it, show it, share it. That's it. It's not unusual. It's the normal life cycle of a Christ carrier, where the Lord takes us from non-Christ carrier to Christ carrier to Christ carrying disciple to disciple making disciple and finally to disciple making disciple maker. If you receive this message today, I'm going to ask you to meet me in prayer, and to pray this prayer with me. Lord, thank you for saving me. Thank you for being the author and finisher of my faith. Thank you for not letting me go. Thank you for your life-changing word, making me like you are in this world. Thank you for freeing me from my fallen self and raising me up. In the name of Yeshua, I give you praise, honor, and glory. Amen. Brothers and sisters, this has been Discipleship 101, Part 10. We cannot I truly hope that you have been blessed by today's message. And I hope the Lord spoke to you and uh, helped you come as he has helped me come, that we would come together to the revelation that this is just not about us. For so many, their Christian experience hinges on them, the, how good a job they're doing, how well they're doing, what they're doing, what they're not doing, their commitment to Christ deepening their walk with the Lord. We do so many things that center on us and don't even realize when we say it that we are the star of the show. 
But this is not that. This has happened to us by the grace of God. We give him glory. We give him thanks. We worship and honor him because we can't take credit for it. We are, and we, we are where we are. We are who we are by the grace of God. And so today, I extend this message to you, and I pray that you are blessed by what you have heard. Father, we thank you for this message and thank you for this time that you've given us to come before you and to consider. Thank you for those who have heard, for those who have listened, those who will listen after the fact. Pray that this message will fall on good ground and bring forth a tremendous harvest. Bless you, Lord, and we thank you for loving us as you do, for never giving up, for establishing a plan in our lives that we would be like Christ and for assuring us that you'll never leave us nor forsake us. We bless you. We honor and thank you. In all this we pray and thank you. In the name of Yeshua, who is the Christ. Amen. Thank you for tuning in to another life-changing message from Kingdom Life Community. If today's message blessed you, please like, comment, and subscribe. But most importantly, share. Share this message with your family, friends, co-workers, or anyone else you think needs to hear this word. You never know how it will impact them. We pray that you have a blessed week and remember to live the kingdom life. We'll see you soon.